this morning, I'll talk about the ECG components. I'm almost done with them. And then we'll start the cardiac ash potential. So the next slide is the uh, rat T wave. So this would be when the muscle is starting to relax. You would see it during isovolumetric relaxation of the cardiac cycle. Isovolumetric relaxation. So there it is there, the T waves at the top. And then, um, oh, I put the red box here. There's the T wave. They put it right as isovolumetric relaxation is beginning to occur. So that's what's going on in the heart. The other components you're supposed to measure include the TP segment. So that segment is after the T to the next P. So here is my T wave, and then it's that segment between cardiac cycles. You go from end of T to next P. This segment represents most of inflow. Most of the tricular film. So they, um, yeah, that's kind of what I highlight here. The heart is filling, the bicuspid valve opens and you start to fill. That's the TP segment. Um, you could also measure peak to peak, R to R, between cardiac cycles. R to R, say from this R wave to that R wave, the time elapsed from one R to the next R, um, that's actually your heart rate. Let's say the distance, the time elapsed R to R. In today's lab, you're going to measure that as a setting called delta t, the difference in time. Delta is just the difference between this time point, highlight, to that time point on the computer screen, get that time difference. Let, let's say that that time is 0 0.8 seconds. That is your average cardiac cycle. Of course, it will vary. Yeah, but that, that, that's the time elapsed. And how is that your heart rate? Well, that time elapsed represents the time. That, that's one heartbeat, OK? The time between one heartbeat to the next, OK? So um, let's say you have the one heartbeat. I gave this to you before. I'll give it to you again. 0 0.8 seconds. You multiply that. Multiply uh, that. Multiply that. seconds per minute. I did this math before, right? That gives you 75 beats per minute. So the question becomes, well, what is it going to be in your subject, the R to R? 
What if uh, the, the elapsed time is one second? Don't think too hard. What's your heart rate? 60, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So notice if there's more time between heartbeats, you have a slower heart rate. Okay. What if that time shrinks? That means your heart's beating faster, so your heart rate will increase. So that's today's life. You get a chance to do that. And um, you're going to measure all the ECG components, the ones I started with with the P wave. And find a page like this in your book or in the lab and just try to compare. Uh, I want you to print it out. It's on there somewhere. How to measure the ECG components and the time elapsed. These are the normal durations, so you know you're within the ballpark if you measure it right. This is how to measure it. For example, P wave. Start of P deflection, return to isoelectric line. So, you know, it's if you forget how to measure things, that can tell you how to do it. And um, note the page number. For today's lab, um, I'll remind you later, but the ECG lab, it's, um, we're going to start on page 462 to the end, because I know the page numbers are from a big lab manual, so those are the page numbers. And um, in our, our um, lab, your subject will be lying down. That's why I ask students to bring yoga mats, lie down comfortably, you, you sit or stand up. Um, and then exercise. Now the point of lying down is the effect of physiology. You eliminate the hydrostatic pressure of standing vertical. So when you're lying flat, uh, the blood volume kind of evens out. So when you stand up or sit up, the blood kind of rushes down. You feel a little lightheaded. And that's called orthostatic hypotension. You lie, sit up or stand up. I'll put stand in parentheses because I believe your protocol says to sit up. Either way, you're going to see this. It's called orthostatic hypotension. Hypo means pressure drop. Tension means pressure. Hypo means less than. So a drop in pressure. Now, we're not going to measure blood pressure, but here's what we are going to measure. Heart rate. To compensate for... Um, a drop in BP, expect to see an increase in heart rate in your subject. So remember this part of the lecture when you record that data. Lie down, sit up. That top graph shows an increase in heart rate right here. And it correlates with that orthostatic hypotension drop in pressure. This happens really quickly after you sit up, within the first 20 seconds. All right, I want to go right into the next lecture slides, the cardiac gas potential. Start that. So now we're going to go micro. We, we talked about the ECG of the entire heart. Now we're going to talk about the microscopic, microscopic anatomy. Think about the two cell types there. You have contractile cells. These can, these, this is the heart muscle. We call them contractile cells in this lecture. They're filled with mitochondria. The heart's very aerobic. We have the autorhythmic cells. These are like the SAAV node cells, the cells that self-generate the action potential. The difference is, um, well, there's many differences between these cells. One difference I want you to make is between the heart muscle cells, the cardiac muscle cells, and compare it with skeletal muscle function. That's one of the things we'll do today. For example, cardiac muscle has intercalated discs. You don't see that in the, heart, in the skeletal muscle. 
I don't want to write it on the board. You should already know this, that skeletal muscle, not cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, they have tendons. They have a connected tissue system, like tendons they insert onto bones. So when the skeletal muscle contracts, you move the joints, right? That's what you studied at 430. For heart, you're not moving joints, you're beating, you're, you're pumping blood. So these structures do two things. One, they help spread this, the ash potential signal throughout the heart. They also keep the heart muscle cells glued together. So as you generate pressure, you don't split apart. So the inter intercalated discs really help in that. Um, if you look at this part of the figure here, like what we would see on our slides, you'd see the striations of the muscle, you'd see these dark bars, which are the intercalated discs. You don't see it in skeletal muscle. The illustration shows you the structure. There's a horizontal part, and then there's this kind of vertical part within that little dark bar. It's basically a squiggly line, but what they're showing you here in this horizontal part of the intercalated disc are gap junctions. We draw a couple of little gap junctions, which are connecting proteins between cells, but they have a pore through it. <coughs> so in this horizontal part, we have gap junctions. I said horizontal part. That helps the spread of signal. So this is a barrier between two cells. The signal or the action potential, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's going to spread uh, easily from cell to cell through the gap junctions. Now, the vertical part, uh, this has these um, structures called desmosome. which have these dense plaques. I'll draw a couple. And um, they kind of glue the cell membranes together with little interlocking proteins. I'll just draw little green things in there basically to glue the cells together. They have other <coughs> tonal fibrils, other fibrils. You can, you can look up desmosome if you want. It's taught in chapter three. So the, the desmosomes act as a glue, so as the heart generates tension, the tissue remains intact. Desmosomes function as like a glue. Uh, well, they're, they're in the vertical part of the desmosome. I'm saying the desmosome is in the vertical part of the intercalated disc. Let me say that right. Here's a picture showing you that, more simply. Gap junction in the horizontal part. In the vertical part, you have um, the desmosome. zone. They call it zona adherens in this picture. Well, anyways, so I think that's very important to, to note because you don't see it in skeletal muscle. There are other differences. In, and there are some similarities between cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. Okay, so we got intercalated discs, but let me erase, erase that and note some other things. striations for both. That means the tissue under the microscope has a striped appearance. What that really means is the tissue has contractile proteins for, you know, it can contract. Right? It's muscle. That's usually what I think when I see striations in a tissue. Other tissues like connective tissue don't have striations like muscle does. Uh, the other thing is, muscle cells in cardiac muscle, there's an extensive branching system. So if you have a cell and it branches, 
and it keeps branching. If you have a signal begin here, because of gap junctions, if it's branched, they'll spread to every cell. Okay, it'll go there, it'll go there, it'll go there. It'll go all the way through all of your cells because they're all branched together. And we talked about how the signal spreads from SA to AV node, the bundle of his, the bundle branches, all throughout the heart. And the gap junctions will help uh, as it spreads through those different structures, it'll be spread to the heart muscle too. Okay. Now, skeletal muscle is less branched. The muscle fibers are kind of in parallel, not branched off of each other. So let's say you have a few muscle fibers. And remember, they have all those nerves, the edge of memorize, that innervate the muscles. So if you have a central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, the cerebellum, the somatic nerves that we taught you, like for example, musculocutaneous innervates by says brachii. Well, you know. So that means a nerve has to innervate the muscle fibers. If you put a black box around to illustrate the concept, because of the SA node, the signal can spread throughout the whole heart. Nothing has to enter the black box, it's intrinsic. But a nerve has to innervate, okay? It has to enter the black box. It's extrinsic stimulation. Extrinsic. So that's a key difference, correct? We call this one motor neuron, all the muscle fibers it innervates. That's a motor unit. Okay, so that's why there's not so much branching. They have the motor units. They depend on the, the innervation there. So this is kind of what I mean by my next point. How do you get muscle to contract in a skeletal muscle system is the all or none principle. All or none. If the motor unit fires, you get all the muscle fibers that it innervates, or none of it. Okay. For skeletal muscle, I'm sorry, for cardiac muscle, it's a functional syncytium. A functional syncytium, well, let's go back to this word. Does this look familiar? It's one of the answers on the lab practical. Remember the syncytial trophoblast? Same thing. A syncytium in physiology means fused tissue. I think I mentioned that before. Let me remind you of that. Where, where the cellular integrity breaks down and you have a big cytoplasm mass. It's all fused together. Now, the heart is like that, but not a true syncytium. It's a functional one. Because the cardiac muscle cell membranes, they, they remain intact. But it, it functions like a syncytium because of all the gap junctions. So that's what they mean. So in heart muscle, because the signal spreads to every single cardiac muscle cell, all the cardiac muscle cells are contracted. So all contractile cells are contracted already with each heartbeat. The whole thing, you're getting the whole heart contracted. So for example, when you exercise, when you're substituting exercises, and you have to increase the blood flow to the working muscles, the heart has to be harder and faster. So because all the muscle cells are already contracting, each individual fiber, each individual muscle cell has to contract harder. So to Increase, uh, what am I going to do here? Uh, let me write. 
cardiac muscle to increase the force, each individual cell must contract harder because they're all contracting. So they call that the contractility of the heart. You increase the contractility. Now, skeletal muscle is different. If you want to increase force, let's say, for example, you're bench pressing 250 pounds and you have up it to 350 pounds, well, you need to recruit more motor units to increase the force. To increase force. <clears throat> increase. Motor unit recruitment. So if that force, this red motor unit, is not enough force, we need to recruit more. Maybe we just draw another one, draw blue, and all of that. Okay, maybe this innervates a bunch more uh, muscle fibers. So now you have two motor units, you, you increase the force. And of course, you can train these muscles. Of course, you have to do it different ways, right? The cardio workout, it's sustained regular exercise. But, you know, resistance training, that's how you um, improve the performance of skeletal muscle. Okay. Those are the physiological differences, all or none, or functional sensation. You know. But in both, calcium is extremely important in the cross bridge cycling. So go back and review cross-grid cycling. Calcium binds the troponin. And when you do that, you move the tropomyosin, you expose the binding site to form those cross bridges. If you just did not understand that, you have to go back and review it. Calcium is important for muscle function. Okay, you can teach that in 4 3 a little. Let's move on. Okay, so let's kind of step away from skeletal muscle. And let's compare the action potentials of these cells, the muscle cells, to like ones of the autorhythmic cells on the left on the picture. And all the muscle cells, that's most of the heart, right? 99%. Less than 1% are cells of the SA and the AB node. We call those the autorhythmic cells in this lecture. They're automatic. They, they self-generate action potentials all by themselves. make on this side of the board. So these cells are the cells of primarily SA and the AB node. That's usually what we talk about. And let's remember the, the, the purpose of these cells. For the autorhythmic cells, their job is for the pacemaker potential, the self-generate APs. And because the signal spreads throughout the whole heart and the whole heart contracts as a result, that's the job of the contractile cells. Their job is when they generate tension, there's a force for pumping. 
obviously that's during systole, not diastole. When you eject blood from the R, that, that's how I think of it. Now the action potentials for each are, are a little different. Like for the autorhythmic cells, um, if you look on the left, doesn't it look kind of like this? Kind of like that shape. But the um, cardiac muscle cell is more like that. Okay, now, um, so when I say action potential, this whole thing is the, is the action potential for the contractile cell. And this spike here is the, the action potential for the outer rhythmic cell. So the, the differences we'll, we'll go through. One of the things I have there, because you have that pacemaker potential thing, what is that? You have a pacemaker potential for here, but not for the contractile cell. So the, you have the action potential, but the pacemaker potential is this part here, or, or this part here. I'm going to draw in blue. It's a slow rise to threshold. Remember threshold potential? Potential. For example, if I put, let's say it's here. THR threshold. The threshold potential was that when if you depolarize to that point, you, you get an action potential. Okay, each and every time. So in uh, modern rhythmic cells, they don't have a resting potential. Every time they get to a negative potential, these funny channels open and you get this slow depolarization of threshold each time. This is very important because this rate, this time that it takes to reach threshold, that's your heart rate. Because every time this fires in the SA node, it's spreading to the whole heart. It starts from the SA node. It only takes 150 milliseconds to get down to the ventricles. So that is why they call it pacemaker, okay? When you get a pacemaker, put in your, you know, they usually put it here. I usually see them sub-Q and they, they put electrodes down the, it's scary that they can do that. They put electrodes down into the right atrium. They usually use the subclavian veins to do it. But anyways, you can get a pacemaker, but this is your biological pacemaker, the SA and the AB. Now that's why that pacemaker potential is so important. It determines your heart rate. Now, if you go over here, uh, this is a resting potential. So you have a resting potential, you have an action potential. There's no threshold. There's no threshold potential. There are no graded potentials. No threshold potential, no graded potentials. Graded potentials, well, there's small little zaps where you just kind of like change the threshold or change the potential a little bit, and the goal is to reach threshold. There's none of that. The reason why you don't need it, you can go straight from rest to action because of the gap junctions. Those gap junctions, the ionic flow just zaps the cell, you go straight to action. Okay. Um, now, because the job of the cardiac muscle is the force for pumping, that's where you can measure the tension. So that this graph here is a double double Y axis, millivolts, as well as they have a purple line for tension. I want to move on unless there's any questions on these action potentials. We're going to talk about them more. So here's a review of how the signal spreads throughout the heart. SA. 
then the atrial muscle contracts. And the signal gets the AB node. And then the signal travels down the bundle of hiss, bundle branches to the apex, up the sides of the heart, to the Purkinje fibers. Most of you saw them. OK. Boom, boom. You can see the Purkinje fibers going to the papillary muscle. So it's only taking like time zero for about 150 milliseconds before you see an action potential in the ventricular muscle. It doesn't take long. All right, so since I'm talking about oxygen potential, I always like to give a, a neurophys review, just to rehash the basic concepts just for a second. How many of you took me for 4.30? One, two, three. Is that it? One, two, three. Only seven of you? So I always do this, because I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So, you know, the, the basic thing I teach when I teach 430, I just kind of go, like, okay, you get a membrane. And we always use that term membrane potential. What's, what's the charge difference between the cell membrane on the inside and on the outside? Like, for example, if you have a positive charge on the outside, usually it's attracted to, like, a negative charge on the other side. There's kind of some kind of like, they can kind of like feel each other through the cell membrane kind of a thing. And um, kind of the natural state is just to be kind of like, as negative outside is on the inside. Let's say this is inside the cell, this is out. Okay, so if you were to measure the difference between with a voltmeter, you would measure no difference in potential, and you would register zero volts, okay? Now, what we teach in 430 about how cells establish a resting membrane potential, it's uh, more like, it's like negative on the inside with respect to the outside. Remember that? Now the inside is usually like negative with respect to the outside, something like negative 70 millivolts, something like that. Okay. That, that's the membrane potential. And, and this, this is important. This um, makes an excitable cell excitable because this is a polarized state. It's polarized. Right? because it's like a charge separation. But you could depolarize it, and usually um, for cells, they have a very large concentration of potassium on the inside of the cell, and a very large concentration of sodium on the outside of the cell. Now everywhere else inside the cell, relatively outside, it's all equal in charge. It's only at the membrane where you are supposed to measure this difference, okay? Across the membrane, that's it. Um, so if you depolarize a cell, let's say you had uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. Draw one there inside the cell membrane. Because the cell membrane is gonna keep a positive cation out because the positive charge can't, can't get past the hydrophobic zone of the phospholipid bilayer thing. And uh, well, well, anyways, so if so, a positive charge comes in, it's following its electrical concentration gradient. You're letting positive in. I mean, you're depolarizing the membrane potential, right? I just put depole. Now, if you're measuring it in the lab, you're at rest, you would see an upswing of membrane potential. You even overshoot equilibrium because the, the sodium current in physiology is one of the strongest currents that you can measure. Uh, it's big, so 
this side. That's the dipole. Now, the, the word that physiologists like to use is permeability. P for permeability. What we say is, during depolarization, the permeability of the cell of, so, of a two sodium PNA is much greater than its permeability to potassium. That allows you to depolarize the positive influx. And then what happens is you, you repolarize. Voltage gated potassium channels. The gradient is such that when those channels are open, potassium would leave. So positive charge leaving, it repolarizes the cell. So that's kind of what we mean. And so the, during repolarization, the permeability of the cell to potassium is much greater than of sodium. You just flip it. The permeabilities change. Okay. So that, that's um, basically what you talked about in, in the ash potential. So I just want to remind students that there are ions that carry these currents across excitable cells, like muscle. So when we talk about action potentials, you could measure action potentials in cells at different locations, as shown here, one, two, three, four, five different locations. But we're going to just talk about two of them, because there's basically two varieties. Boom, that one, and boom, that one. That's, those are the ones I drew earlier, right? That, that's where I'm going with this. We want to know which currents cause which parts uh, of the action potentials. And uh, I think a good time to start that will be Friday, not today. I want to make sure you have enough time to do the ECG lab. Let's take our break now. Uh, I need some. I need to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's break until uh, 12:15.